welcoming Mark J. P. Wolf. Mark, are you there? His uh, internet has been going out a little bit, so hopefully, there he is. Yeah, we have a lot of people teaching online, so the uh, connections can be a little unstable sometimes, so sorry about that. All right. Oh, and I before we start, also, I'd like to just invite everybody to, to go up to the upper right-hand corner of your screen and switch to speaker view because it's easier to see the speaker that way. And also, I'll be doing uh, slides, and so the screen sharing, you'll be able to see the slides larger, too, that way. Okay. Thank you, Mark. All right. I'm going to switch to my PowerPoint here. And in the beginning. Okay, so my paper, my talk is A Brief History of Video Games, Their Art, Technology, and Culture. Uh, video games are one of the fastest growing and influential media of recent decades, and one that has spread to a variety of venues, and uh, including arcade and dedicated console systems to computers of all kinds, the internet, mobile devices uh, such as cell phones, and so on. They're used for entertainment, education, business, job training, and research in psychology and the social sciences, and more uses continue to appear as games are designed to fit them. As their technology and forms have changed over time, <coughs> uh, and this talk will trace not only their history, but the way video games have changed as a medium and as popular culture. Uh, the history of video games begins around the mid 20th century, uh, following the spread of the cathode ray tube as an imaging device for television and later computer screens. Although video game technology began slowly, the development of video games sped up considerably after they became a commercial product in the 1970s, and a decade after that, they became a formidable cultural force. The history of video games has impacted not only popular culture, but the history of all other media as well. Video games also occupy an important position in the history of public computing, since arcade video games and home game consoles were the first computers used and purchased by consumers, uh, the introduction of the computer into the public arena, and the first form of the electronic interactive audiovisual entertainment. So some definitions and early developments. The earliest idea for video games can be traced back to 1947, uh, when Thomas T. Goldsmith and S. O. Ray Mann filed a patent which described an interactive game played on a cathode ray tube. An actual working video game, however, did not appear until sometime later, and Goldsmith and Mann's patent seems to have been forgotten, uh, leaving little or no impact on the industry. In general, then, we can say certain early mainframe games are usually the first to be considered as video games, with Space War, developed by Steve Russell, Martin Gratz, and Wayne Wittanen at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, often considered the first complete game by today's standards. Mainframe games were found mostly in university laboratories and the first communities of game players and programmers formed around them. Uh, the development of such games continued into the 1970s and included the first online games like Maze War and Space Sim uh, from 1974, which were among the first games to network players together, allowing them to play from different locations at the same time. Mainframe games, however, were only available to the university students and faculty who understood computers and had access to them, making them a very specific kind of subculture rather than popular culture. To become more than just a novelty, video games had to find a way to reach a broad audience, but the expensive and complex technology they required meant that they would need to be adapted to existing public venues. Two of the, the, the two most promising possibilities were television and the arcade. On the one hand, people were already enjoying arcade games such as pinball and electromechanical games like racing games and those with mounted guns and miniature shooting galleries, so it would be just a matter of adding video to these games. On the other hand, CRTs were already used in television sets, 
So it would be just a matter of adding games to the video equipment at home. In 1966, inventor Ralph Baer, looking for new uses for television sets, began developing his brown box series of experiments at Sanders Associates. The series of prototypes he produced would lead to the first home video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, uh, <coughs> in 1972. The Odyssey included 12 built-in games activated by plug-in carts or cartridges, along with colored screen overlays, playing cards, and dice. Just as video games were the first computers available to the public, the Odyssey was the first video game system and thus in many cases the first computer product as well, to enter the home, which would eventually become the main venue for video game play. New versions of the Odyssey would continue to appear until the Odyssey 2, and that's like a raise to, in 1978. The Odyssey was successful selling uh, 350,000 units, and the system was exported to countries around the world, including home video games on a global scale, or introducing home video games on a global scale and setting the stage for what would quickly become a global industry. Meanwhile, as home games were developing, Stanford University graduate Bill Pitts and his friend Hugh Tuck were working on a coin-operated version of Space War, which resulted in Galaxy Game, which was installed in Stanford's student union. The first mass-produced coin-operated video game, however, appeared a month later. Uh, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney's Computer Space, uh, which was base, also based on Space War. Uh, the controls were too complicated for players, but the game found mild success and allowed Bushnell and Dabney to go on to found Atari and hire Al Alcorn. Uh, it was their next game that brought Atari worldwide fame and success. Pong in 1972, which what became wildly popular and came to represent the new industry. An industry begins. During the years that followed Pong's release, video arcade games began displacing pinball and other electromechanical arcade games, eventually becoming the dominant type of game in the arcade. The Odyssey and Pong inspired uh, many copyright uh, copycat games and systems as other companies began producing ball and paddle games for the home and arcade. Integrated circuits reduced the size of electronic components and made new electronic products possible, like pocket calculators and handheld electronic games. Home computers appeared around this time as well, with micro-instrumentation and telemetry systems, Altair, 8800 selling as a mail order kit for hobbyists beginning in 1975 and Steve Wozniak's handmade Apple I computers in 1976. In 1976, General Instruments released the AY38500 chip, which included all the components needed to make a ball and paddle game into one chip, encouraging their production. Coleco was the first company to order the chip, and a rush of other companies followed suit as the home video game industry flourished. The rush to cash in on the home video game craze made dozens of companies produce second-rate products to try and beat their opponents to market. Some systems, like General Home Products Wonder Wizard, did not even bother to have a copyright notice on their boxes. Even systems that have long since been forgotten by the public found success initially. National Semiconductor's Adversary, a home game system, for example, sold uh, over 200,000 units in 1976. Around 70 companies were amongst the competitors, and one of the most successful, Atari, was bought by Warner Communications for $28 million, not bad for a company whose modest start had only been four years earlier. The market flooded with these games, both in, U in the United States and Europe, while their novelty faded, eventually leading to the video game industry crash of 1977. The pocket calculator industry had seen a similar crash and hinted at the possibility of the home video game industry's crash. In both cases, there was no lack of consumer demand, which was great enough to lead to chip shortages. It was the, number, it was the large number of competitors coupled with severe price drops and the lack of profits that followed, especially for smaller companies that could not withstand huge losses, 
which was the case of both crashes. The industry recovered quickly, however, largely thanks to the appearance of the second generation of home video game technology, programmable video game consoles, which use cartridges, as opposed to the dedicated consoles, which had all their games built in. The first such system appeared in 1976 from Fairchild Semiconductor, the Fairchild Channel F, originally named the Video Entertainment System, which sold for $169.95 and did fairly well during the 1976 Christmas season. In 1979, the rights to the Channel F were bought by Zircon International, and in all, 26 cartridges were released for the system. Although the Channel F introduced the idea of cartridge-based systems, it was quickly overshadowed by another cartridge-based system that was released the following year, the Atari Video Computer System, which was later renamed the Atari 2600. Not only were its name and products already well known, Atari was the only company and would remain the only company to produce arcade video games, home console games, and home computers, allowing it to port its popular titles from one platform to another. The game, however, that really helped to popularize the system was Atari's home version of Space Invaders, the Japanese arcade game that was so popular in Japan that the country is said to have suffered a shortage of 100 yen coins needed to play the game and had to mint more of them. Space Invaders became the first game to be licensed to another company, and its success led Atari lic to licensing, um, led to Atari licensing other hits like Williams Defender for its home system. The Atari VCS 2600 would compete with other systems, including the Coleco Telstar from 1976, the Mattel and Television from 1979, the ColecoVision in 1982, and Atari's own Atari 5200 in 1982. Like silent films in their earliest days, video games did not include credits, and designers at Atari saw little of the profits from their popular games since they worked on a salary. The lack of recognition led to one programmer, Warren Robinette, to include his name as an Easter egg in Adventure and four other Atari programmers, David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Ed Miller, and Bob Whitehead even left Atari in 1979 to start their own company, Activision, that made cartridges for the Atari 2600, becoming the first independent developer and distributor of video games for home console systems. Activision actively publicized the names of their programmers and found success with their games. In the following years, many other companies made cartridges for the Atari 2600, including Imagix, Data East, Zonox, and even companies outside the video game industry released uh, cartridges, including Parker Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and even Quaker Oats. Over the years, more than a thousand different cartridges would be produced for the Atari 2600, making it the leading home console system of the late 1970s and early 1980s. Home consoles, however, were not just competing with each other, but with other sectors of the industry, including arcade games and the new market sectors of handheld games, home computer games, and online games. New technologies and growing competition. In 1976, a new type of toy appeared that would begin an entire industry, the handheld electronic game. That year, Mattel released Auto Race, the next year, they released football and other sports games like baseball and basketball would appear in 1978. Other companies followed suit. Coleco had its own head-to-head -head series of electronic handheld sports games. Milton Bradley's Microvision, the first cartridge-based handheld system, appeared in 1979, and Nintendo en entered the market in 1980 with its Game & Watch series, and other companies like Bandai and Megacorp had their own series of pocket-sized handheld games. Electronic handheld games also pushed the boundaries of what popularly were called video games. The screens used by handheld games were either LED-based, like Mattel's Football, or LCD-based, like Megacorp's Fireman Fireman or Bandai's Solar-Powered Invader of the Mummy's Tomb. Invaders of the Mummy's Tomb. 
Most games using LCD-based screens had elements that simply turned on or off instead of pixel-based displays, though Milton Bradley's microvision system did have a 16 by 16 pixel-based display, allowing it to produce low-resolution imagery. <coughs> While they were technically not video games, since they did not use video, the structures of the games, gameplay, and the activities they involved were similar to video games, and some video games and franchises, like Pac-Man and Nintendo's Mario, would be ported over to handheld games. Due to all these similarities, the games were often seen as part of the video game craze of the time. The popular use of the term video game was also expanded through the use of another new technology that appeared in the arcade with the arrival of Cinematronics Space Wars in 1977, uh, Vector Graphics. Uh, unlike raster graphics monitors that scanned either the entire screen for every frame of imagery, Vector graphics monitors drew images on screen one line at a time, drawing only what was needed and leaving the rest of the screen dark. The resulting images were sharper and faster to draw, but they were for the most part limited to wireframe renderings since they could not produce filled in areas very easily. The technology was technically not video, but the games used cathode ray tubes and pr produced moving images and to the general public of the time, they didn't seem all that different. Uh, from video. Vector games were produced from the, uh, the late 1970s and early 1980s by companies including Cinematronics, Vector Beam, Atari, Exidy, and Sega. <coughs> and one vector based home console appeared in 1982 the GCE Milton Bradley Vectrix. Notable vector games include Speed Freak from 1978, Warrior from 1979, Asteroids, also from 1979. Battlezone from 1980, Tempest from 1981, and Star Wars from 1983. Because their graphics were based on coordinates and lines, vector games were the first to present computationally true three-dimensional graphics to video games, first in the car crash seen in Speed Freak, and perhaps most notably in the three-dimensional environment in which Battlezone took place. Vector games would be produced until around the mid-1980s, eventually falling out of favor when three-dimensional filled polygon graphics would take over as the main method for three-dimensional graphics in the late 1980s. The most revolutionary new technology to appear in the mid to late 70s, however, were home computers, which quickly became a platform for video games. While many consumers at the time initially seemed to have little use for a home computer, since older technologies like the pocket calculator, typewriter, Rolodex, and card catalog were still around, video games provided a reason to buy a home computer in many households. The Texas Instruments 99-4A home computer even had a cartridge slot built into it. Um, and home computers in general also allowed users to write their own games or type in the code for games appearing in hobbyist magazines. Atari produced its own line of home computers, including the Atari 400, the Atari 800, and the Atari ST series. Home computers also helped video games gain respectability since they could help teach programming and the logical thinking that it required. Even the Atari 2600 had a cartridge named Basic Programming from 1979. With the addition of modems, Home computers could use telephone lines and network with each other, resulting in new possibilities for gameplay. Online games had been around since the network games on mainframe computers, but these were mainly at universities and not available to the general public. In 1978, the first publicly available bulletin board system, or BBS, came online in Chicago, and the first multi-user domain, or MUD, came on online in Exus, England. BBSs allowed users to post messages to read by other members of the online community and trade files as well, whereas MUDs allowed real-time interaction between users who were logged in simultaneously. Both BBSs and MUDs would eventually become venues for online gaming in the early 1980s as user interaction was structured into role-playing games. Some early online games, like Scepter of Goth from 1983, 
allowed as many as 16 users to dial in at once and play. The first online console games came shortly after with the release of Mattel's Play Cable service in 1981 and the CBC GameLine service in 1983. Mattel's Play Cable delivered games for its Intellivision system, while the CBC GameLine allowed uh, Atari 2600 users to receive games online. The CBC GameLine master module plugged into Atari 2600 cartridge port had an internal 1200 baud modem through which games could be loaded into the unit's eight kilobyte of RAM, allowing games to be downloaded and played, but not saved. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, home video game console systems and home computers were also being exported to Asia, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and South America, which started new industries, first for the importation of games and consoles, and later for the indigenous production of them. For example, Nintendo, which produced playing cards, had been around since 1889 and first ventured into video games in 1974 as the distributor of the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan. The following year, it produced its first electromechanical arcade game, EVR Race, and in 1978, its first arcade video games, Computer Othello and Black Fiber, Block Fiber. By the end of the 1970s, video games had become a powerful source in popular culture as their popularity increased with some games like Space Invaders, Pac-Man 1980 and Defender 1980, succeeding internationally and taking in hundreds of millions of dollars each. Video games were discussed in the media, stores sold out of them during the holiday season, and many companies rushed to join in the frenzy, producing third-party games, console systems, computer games, handheld games, and arcade games. New arcades opened across North America, and by 1982, arc arcade video games had reached their peak, with about 10,000 arcades in operation in the United States alone. It looked like the craze would continue for some time. But the home market was growing saturated with cheap imitations of successful games, and despite prices being slashed, consumer interest could only be sustained for so long. After a decade of constant innovations, people came to expect technological advances, and video games novelty began to wane. Soon it was clear that another industry crash was imminent the great North American video game crash and recovery. The 1977 video game industry crash was certainly a warning of what could happen and other early warnings indicated that consumer interest was dropping and that the boom would not continue. In October of 1981, Atari held its coin out $50,000 world championship in Chicago, expecting around 10,000 players to attend, but only around 250 came. In the last quarter of 1982, arcade profits fell unexpectedly. The number of arcades had nearly doubled from 1980 to 1982, but in 1983, over 2,000 of them would close. The oversaturated nature of the market became especially apparent in 1983, when industry-wide profits amounted only to 2.9 billion, down about 35% from 1982. The crash worsened into 1983 and lasted over two years. Companies that were testing the waters of the video game market withdrew, and even major players like Mattel, who had once been the th third largest video game maker, earning 250 million from its Intellivision system in 1981, left the market altogether in 1983. Even Atari was hit hard and lost over half a billion dollars in 1983, despite being the market's major player. Only one new home video game system appeared in 1984, Rick Dyer's Halcyon system, and it was a failure. The home video game market had sunk to a new low. Video games novelty had worn off, the golden age of arcade games was over, and no one knew how long it would be until the industry bounced back, or even if it would. Dyer's Halcyon system was based on laser disc technology, which some hoped would pull the industry out of its slump. Laserdisc games had first appeared with Electrosports Quarter Horse in 1981, 
a game that had one screen for game graphics and another for horse race video clips used by the game. Most games, however, used their video clips directly in their gameplay, either as a background the players flew over, as in Milestars Mach 3, or as animated segments representing a player's action during the game, as in Cinematics Dragon's Lair from 1983. Cinematronics, I'm sorry, Dragon's Lair from 1983. While the games had a had better graphics as a result, the fact that the video clips could not be changed, only played in a different sequence, greatly limited what interactivity was possible. In Dragon's Lair, for example, there were only a few choices a player could make in any given situation, all of them animated screens that would play once the player had made a choice. Laserdisc games typically cost twice as much as standard arcade games, charging players 50 cents a play. In the end, Laserdisc games failed to catch on due to the lack of interesting gameplay and higher expenses for both players and arcade operators. The crash finally ended in 1985 when a foreign import became a hit in North American market, assuring U.S. game makers that home consoles could still be popular. The system that brought the industry out of the crash had been selling in Japan since 1983 as the Nintendo Famicom, which was renamed the Nintendo Entertainment System for its North American release. The NES introduced the third generation of home video game consoles and was an 8-bit machine, making it the most advanced home system yet to appear, and Nintendo allayed retailers' hesitance to stock another video game console by promising to buy back unsold systems. The system was a success. The NES soon had a large library of games, and Nintendo was more careful than Atari had been when it came to third-party licensing. Hundreds of cartridges were released for the NES, and the Nintendo dominated the American game market even after the release of other third-generation systems like the Sega Master System in 1985 and Atari's 7800 Pro System in 1986. The growing home computer market. While the arcade and home console markets were undergrowing consumer adult and crises, home computers were steadily growing stronger as a market sector with the release of such machines as the IBM PC, Commodore VIC-20, and the Xerox Star in 1981, the Commodore 64 in 1982, the Apple IIe and Apple Lisa in 1983, and the Apple Macintosh and Tandy 1000 in 1984. Home computers, in addition to being able to offer software other than just games, also had some advantages when it came to games. Better storage capacity due to floppy disk drives, the ability to save games, online capabilities due to modems, and the potential for hobbyists to be able to write and exchange their own homebrew games. Some programmers, like Richard Garriott, creator of the Ultima series, went on to sell thousands of games and start their own empires and companies. Uh, these advantages encouraged game, certain genres like adventure games, which had longer stories and playing times, relying more on thoughtful consideration than fast action and sports games and simulations which required more complicated interfaces and more detailed graphics and gameplay. After the Apple Macintosh brought out the graphical user interface to a wide audience, and Microsoft changed over from DOS to Windows, home computers were better equipped to offer games with good graphics and would try to compete with console-based games in all genres. Computer memory was another area of advancement during the 1980s. Just as the cartridges for home console systems were beginning to approach the storage capacity of floppy disks, the home computer industry responded with new media that could hold even more data, like the 3.5 inch diskette, and in 1985, the CD-ROM, an optical disk that could store 650 megabytes of data. Cyan's The Manhole, from 1987, is generally considered to be the first game released on CD-ROM, leading the way for the CD-ROM-based games, which would contain even larger worlds due to the greater memory capacity, such as Cyan's Mist, a best-selling game which encouraged the sale of computers with CD-ROM drives. 
More memory also allowed for full motion video to be incorporated into games, picking up where Laserdisc games had left off. A few years later, home console systems began the changeover to CD-ROM technology. A CD-ROM add-on was released as a peripheral for the NEC PC Engine uh, TurboGrafx-16 in 1989 and for the Sega Mega Drive Sega Genesis in 1992. And in 1991, the FM Towns Marty, released in Japan, became the first 32-bit system and the first console system with a built-in CD-ROM drive. Appearing only three years later, the cartridge-based Nintendo 64 would be the last major system not to use CD-ROMs. By the late 1980s, arcade games were struggling to stay ahead of home game systems. Before the great industry crash, arcade video games were the cutting edge where the best new games were found. They had faster processing speeds, better graphics and sound, and were often the place where new advances in the video game technology debuted. Although computationally true three-dimensional graphics had first appeared in mainframe games, Speed Freak had been the first game to bring them to the public in the arcade, and Battlezone had been the first publicly available game with a three-dimensional environment. Both were vector games with wireframe graphics, but another arcade game, iRobot from 1983, became the first video game to feature filled polygon three-dimensional graphics. The demands of such graphics resulted in simpler game worlds than, than what two-dimensional graphics could offer using hundreds of sprites in games like Pole Position and Space Harrier. And so three-dimensional graphics remained on the sideline a few years until the late 1980s when computer power, computing power and speed improved. The rise of three-dimensional graphics. Around the, 19, around the end of the 1980s, three-dimensional filled polygon graphics returned to the arcade in such games as Hard Driving and Stun Runner, both of 1989, this time with more representational imagery. Three-dimensional graphics found success, and during the 1990s, they would eventually become the new standard in arcade games. Many genres and switched Many genres switched over from two-dimensional graphics to three-dimensional graphics, especially racing games, fighting games, sports games, and shooting games. But the leading edge that arcade games enjoyed was growing smaller, and home computers and home console systems were not far behind them. <clears throat> During the 1990s, an increasing number of home games began to feature three-dimensional graphics as well, both as pre-rendered graphics, like those of Mist and Riven, and those rendered in real time, like those of Tomb Raider. An arcade video game, as arcade video games gradually lost their advantage in the areas of processing speed and graphics, they fought back by introducing new features that would be more difficult for home games to offer. The number of three-player and four-player game, arcade games increased dramatically, and there were even some six-player games like Sega's Hard Dunk and Atari Games' T-Mech, Konami's X-Men, and Namco's uh, Galaxian 3 and Attack of the Zolgear. Several racing games like Namco's Final Lap 2, Sega's Daytona USA, and Max TT Superbike Twin could accommodate up to eight players when the cabinets were networked together, and one game Sega's Daytona USA 2 Power Edition could network up to 40 players. Many arcade games also featured internet um, interf innovative interfaces and cabinet designs, uh, which players could sit on, ride in, or balance on, for example, in games with skis, skateboards, or snowboards. Two games using virtual re reality equipment even appeared. Virtuality's Dacto Nightmare of 1992 and its sequel, Dacto Nightmare 2 Race for the Eggs from 1994. Sports games had, been, had interfaces with fishing rods, soccer balls, bowling balls, pool cubes, boxing gloves, and even a mechanical arm in Jaleco's arm wrestling game 
Okay, Arm Champ and Arm Champ 2. The new genre of rhythm and dance games included new interface devices like the dance pads for Konami's Dance Dance Revolution series. Full-size guitars in their Guitar Freak series and sets of miniature drum heads, short piano keyboards, and DJ turntables for their Beat Mania series of games. Eventually, the popularity of these games would lead to similar peripherals for home games, bringing the home games even closer to arcade games. <coughs> Although some games feature technological innovations, others were part of a cautious retreat to more tried and true genres, including vertically oriented shooting games, fighting games, and driving games. The number of games produced in these genres expanded while games while other genres shrank and fewer innovative games were produced. More sequels and series games were made, relying on their predecessors' successes for instant recognition and acceptance. Few, if any, arcade games from the mid-1990s became household names among even non-players. Perhaps only Mortal Kombat from 1992 was widely known among the general public and infamous, infamously at that, thanks to the controversy surrounding the game's extreme violence. Eventually, even the arcade itself would be redefined as a game center or cyber cafe as operators tried to lure players back. In January as well, the 1990s saw arcades being transformed into amusement centers that were more family-oriented and and untainted by the seedy image that arcades sometimes had. On both continents, it was clear that the home was now the main venue for video gaming. Home games dominate. Home game consoles grew more, pop, more powerful with each new generation of technology. After the NES and other consoles of the third generation, a new generation of 16-bit machines appeared, including the, N, um, including the NC, NEC PC engine TurboGrafx-16 in 1987, the Sega Mega Drive or Sega Genesis in 1988, and the Neo Geo produced uh, a Neo, Neo and the Neo Geo system produced by SNK Playmore, and the Super Nintendo and Ten. Entertainment System, or SNES, uh, both released in 1990. Arcade game technology and home game technology were converging to the point that some systems made the transition from one to the other. The Neo Geo was SNK's home version of their arcade technology of the same name, which allowed arcade operators to change games in a machine by simply changing a cartridge an idea pioneered by Data East's Deco, Deco cassette system in the early 1980s. In the other direction, the Nintendo Play Choice 10 system allowed Nintendo's arcade machines to play games that had been previously only available on the NES. Such interchangeability demonstrated just how far home game consoles had come, and arcade games continued to lose their, superior, their super, um, superiority. Home consoles of the fourth generation were also the first to become regularly sold in Europe, where the market was growing as imports became commonplace. The difference in television technology, NTSC in North America, and PAL and CCAM in Europe was a technical obstacle to be overcome, although some companies like Konami released optimized games to meet both the needs of both markets. The home computer market was also expanding around the globe, allowing, company game, uh, allowing computer games to reach a wider audience and garner greater reviews. Home computers were getting faster, and CD-ROMs with their great storage capacity soon became the standard medium for game releases, replacing cartridges, which were also more expensive to produce. Although CD-ROMs could uh, still require games to have loading screens, Video games could now feature larger worlds, some like Mist and Riven, um, 
each had ten thousands of pre-rendered. Oops. Uh, each had ten thousand had thousands of pre-rendered three-dimensional graphics uh, rendered in real time, allowing certain genres like the first-person shooting games and first-person racing games to become popular in the home. As power and speed increased during the 1990s, many arcade games and franchises were ported to home computers, which would gradually become the major competition of home console systems succeeding where the arcade games had failed. But the console industry was advancing as well. The fifth generation of consoles was mainly made up of 32-bit machines, including the Fujitsu's FM Towns Marty in 1991, the 3DO Interactive Multiplayer and the Atari Jaguar, both from 1983, and the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation, both released in 1984. The fifth generation also included one late entry, the 64-bit Nintendo 64, released in 1996. Competition between these systems was fierce, with claims and comparisons being made as each company <clears throat> uh, with claims and comparisons being made as each company tried to assert the superiority of its own system over that of others. As if it, that weren't enough to contend with, midway through the heyday of the fifth generation, another technical advancement occurred that would soon change the future of video gaming. The internet gained a graphical user interface that came to be known as the World Wide Web. Online gaming had been growing since since the 1980s and early 1990s, giving home gamers some, so, some of the social element an opportunity to play with strangers that, the, that only the arcades had been able to provide. As interest in the World Wide Web increased, multi, multiplayer online games grew and were able to accommodate larger and larger numbers of players, eventually becoming known as massively multiplayer online role-playing with hundreds of thousands of players around the world. The first game to be considered an MMORPG was 3DO's Meridian 59. Oops. But by the end of the 1990s, the three main MMORPGs with the most players were Ultima Online of 1997, EverQuest of 1999, and Asheron's Call of 1999. Online gaming gave home computers another advantage over console systems until modems were included in the next generation of systems, starting with the Sega Dreamcast in 1998. By the mid-1990s, the members of Generation X who had grown up with video games were beginning to have children of their own and were also becoming nostalgic for the early games of their own youth. As home computers became more powerful, emulators for earlier game system consoles began to appear, leading to the retro gaming movement and renewed interest in early games as well. Communities formed on the web to collect and exchange old game information and home brewers even wrote games for older systems like the Atari 2600 and the Vetrix. Over the next couple decades, not only would older games be released in new forms uh, for the newer systems, but the old games would prove to be good fodder for the tiny screens of cell phones and other mobile gaming devices, which had neither the power nor the screen resolution to compete with the home game console and home computer games, handheld games and mobile gaming. Handheld games and portable game systems constituted another oops. Handheld games and portable gaming systems constituted another market sector of games that grew in popularity during the 1990s. Handheld electronic games had been around since 19 since the mid 1970s, but it was not until a decade later that handheld consoles found success. Uh, Gunpei Yokoi, who had previously produced the Game & Watch series of handheld games for Nintendo during the 1980s, developed a handheld console system in 1989, the Nintendo Game Boy. That same year, the Atari Lynx was released, 
and in 1990, they were joined by the Sega Game Gear. Of these three systems, the Game Boy was by far the most, um, I'm sorry, of the three systems, the Game Boy was by far the most popular. And with its line of other Game Boy systems, including Game Boy Pocket, Game Boy Light, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, it went on to become the best-selling line of handheld game console systems of its time. Handheld game systems with their tiny screens and limited graphics capabilities proved that simpler games with low resolution graphics could still attract an audience. Handheld systems, portable gaming devices, and online gaming helped video games to spread around the world where their console gaming had begun, where console gaming had begun to establish a foothold since the days of Pong clones in the 1970s. During the 1980s and 1990s, as video games grew into a global industry, uh, imports from North America and Japan found success and encouraged indigenous game production. Although some countries produced their own game systems or computers, like the Italian Zanussi Pingotronic of 1984, or New Zealand's Sportonic system in the late 1970s, and El Ama Alamiea's soccer home computer system in Kuwait in 1981. Indigenous game production flourished on home computer platforms since companies needed only produce software that could run on established systems, which also provided a much larger potential audience than would the sales of games that required the purchase of a console system, which people were less likely to own. The global reach of video games provided a worldwide audience that made the industry ever more competitive as technology advanced and more venues for video games appeared, including more types, types of handheld games. The first cell phone game appeared in 1994, which was a version of Tetris for the Hagamuk MT2000 and other mobile devices like the iPod uh, would be introduced in 2001, would become platforms for games. Just as cell phones could be, or just as cell phones came to be the dominant communications medium in countries without landline infrastructures, mobile games provided an alternative to console-based gaming, which is more expensive and more location dependent. As mobile gaming platforms are also smaller and less complicated than uh, than consoles, game production is more affordable for developers and thus is a major market sector in developing, uh, developing in undeveloped regions where higher priced console systems have less of a foothold due to their high cost. A diversified industry. By the end of the 1990s, consoles represented large investments on the part of the companies behind them and the competition was reduced around this time to only a few major players who could afford the necessary research and equipment. Atari left the industry no longer produ producing hardware and the first system of the sixth generation of home video consoles, the Sega Dreamcast released in 1998 would be the company's last console system and was discontinued in 2002. The Dreamcast was also the first console with a built-in modem, a feature that all later, um, all later consoles would follow. Other systems of the sixth generation included the Sony PlayStation 2, the Nintendo GameCube, and the Microsoft Xbox. The PlayStation 2, or PS2, released in 2000 and is still, was still selling as of 2011, had become the best-selling console system of all time with over 150 million units sold. The PS2 is backwards compatible and can play games from the first PlayStation, and the console underwent several hardware uh, revisions, including the slimline uh, uh, option, or the slimline revision, which was smaller and more compact. With over 2,000 games available, the PS2 has so far the longest lifespan of any 21st century console. The Nintendo GameCube released in 2001 and discontinued in 2007 was Nintendo's first venture into 
systems using optical disks for storage, using mini DVDs, uh, disks instead of full-size CD-ROMs or DVDs. And the GameCube sold on, just only 21.74 million units worldwide, making it one of Nintendo's lowest selling consoles, along with the Virtual Boy. Finally, the Microsoft Xbox, released in 2001, and this continued in 2006, represented the first new console manufacturer to enter the market in over a decade. The Xbox was the first console to have a built-in hard disk drive, eliminating the need for memory cards. The Xbox is known for its Xbox Live gaming service and the Halo series of games that were introduced with the system's launch. Part of the reason for the relatively short lifespans of most systems of the sixth generation was the relatively quick and um, the relatively quick advance to what is considered the seventh generation of consoles, which included the Microsoft Xbox 360, um, released in 2005, Sony PlayStation 3, and Nintendo Wii, both released in 2006. <laughs> All three systems had, had online capabilities and services, could play other media like CDs and DVDs, and in the case of the PS3, also introduced high definition gaming on, um, on Blu-ray discs. While Nintendo lagged behind Sony and Microsoft during the sixth generation, the Nintendo Wii managed to jump far ahead of its two competitors by following a different strategy with the Wii. Rather than try to compete with the CPU, central processing unit um, of the PS3, the Xbox 360 uh, and the Wii had slower, uh, a slower CPU, but also sold at a lower price, and its Wiimote uh, was the first gesture controller available for a console. The Wiimote, along with family-friendly design and games marketed to a broad audience, led to greater sales and also led Sony and Microsoft to release gesture controllers for their systems the PlayStation Move, and the Microsoft Connect. While online capabilities became standard in control systems, um, I'm sorry, where did I? Okay, while online capabilities became standard in console systems, the market for online home computers grew as well. Dozens of new MMORPGs came online, and during the 2000s, the numbers of players on individual MMORPGs rose into the millions, with the largest one, World of Warcraft, uh, from 2004, reaching 14 million subscribers by the end of 2010. As the World Wide Web continued expanding, web-based games became a new type of online game and were played on personal computers as well as on cell phones, iPods, iPads, and other devices used for mobile gaming. Mobile games, which use smaller screens and are limited to the processing power of mobile devices, are less expensive to develop than state-of-the-art console-based games, which also makes them more popular around the world, as an increasing number of cell phones expands their potential audience over the globe. Uh, while down to only three major players in the council race then, the video game industry has also diversified into new venues, technologies, countries, and market sectors, ensuring the continued growth of the industry for some time to come. <coughs> and finally, new uses for video games. The video game industry has also expanded due to the new uses for video games and the rise of online games led to the production of advert games used to advertise products in a way that engages the user and games designed for social media like Farmville and Nafia Wars, both of 2009. Such games are played within websites where they occur and with the growth of cloud computing, an increasing number of games can be leased online instead of purchased. As a digital distribution and download and downloadable content, or DLC, and the bandwidth of home, computer, uh, home internet connections continues to expand, online games may one day begin to supplant home consoles and home computer gaming, becoming the dominant form of gaming. In addition to advert games, the 2000s also saw a variety of other 
new uses of home video of video games. Businesses began using them for job training, simulations, and even customer service. Educators have been finding new uses for games for years, and much literature has arisen regarding the use of video games in education. Artists like Julian Oliver and Jason Rohr have used video games for artistic expression, creating games that embody ideas and lead to reflection and contemplation. The wide variety of interactive experiences now available through game-like technologies and interfaces has expanded the range and blurred the boundaries of what we consider to be video games as on-screen interactivity becomes more common in everyday life. And finally, the video game as an object of study and preservation. Video games were the object of study by hobbyists from the 1970s onward, and later by psychologists around the mid-1980s, and finally, around the turn of the millennium, video game studies became a field of study in academia. Today, degrees are available in video game design, as well as in video game studies. The study and discussion of older games is also popular in many online communities of gaming hobbyists and video game collectors. The retro gaming movement has also increased uh, interest in early games and a number of growing archives. Uh, here we see the University of Michigan's archives and organizations are documenting and preserving as much early video game history as possible while physical archives are collecting and preserving games, gaming peripherals and other paraphernalia associated with gaming. Video games are now an established as an established medium as film and television and are used by some even more than these media. As video games become even more embedded in daily life through their use in forms of interactive media, they will remain part of both popular culture and an intriguing object of study. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> that was a great presentation, really a ton of information in there. Um, we do have um, one question. When did video game technology leave the entertainment only market and expand edu to education and military training? Are there other industries that use vi video game tech? Well, the expansion actually started in the 70s. Like I mentioned, um, Atari had a cartridge out that was called basic programming so that could be considered educational um, there's a computer game in 1971 a famous one called the Oregon Trail that a lot of people may have uh, played which was educational about the history of the of the settlers and the, and the uh, early pioneers so that was used for edu in a lot of educational like middle schools and uh, places that had computers and that game is from 1971 and then the, as far as military use um, the uh, Arm, U.S. Army had Atari develop a, uh, a, think, a tank program called the Bradley Trainer, which was a, a military version of Battle Zone, and that was also around 1980, and that was something that they were going to use, like, to train tank uh, drivers on. And there was also a, a, a Panzer program on the, on the uh, mainframe computers that were do, for doing something similar like that for tank uh, training. So pretty early on, uh, video games expanded into non-entertainment areas like that. It, in the 1970s, was there really their first, first, um, first time as, as a general product? So that's yeah, they spread they spread pretty early on. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? I think if you um, can either type it in there, you may be able to unmute yourself and ask a question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you. I tried you. to cover everything, yeah. Oh, you certainly covered a lot. That was a ton of information, and I appreciate it. Um, we've got one thank you in there. You really are the master of the information, and that is clear. You are. Okay, and I thank everybody for attending. I believe there's going to be a follow-up um, survey sent to you. Um, and I would appreciate if you would just let us know if you like the presentations and what else you'd like to hear. And again, I thank Mark 
for joining us today. And everyone have an awesome day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Also, the, the video did not go out at all, did it, on your end? No, the video was, was good. Excellent. It was good. Thank you.